Lord, we want to welcome you to our Friday Bible study. As always, we pray that God has been really good to you and that he saw you through some, some difficult times and that you're looking forward to this study as we're looking forward to presenting it to you. Spirit Marvish Ministries, as most, if not all of you know, and I'm James Langston, and again, we're just overjoyed that you took time out of your busy schedule to uh, join in fellowship with us. We pray that by the time this program is finished, uh, that we will have said something that will be a blessing to you, that will encourage you, that will help give you greater insight into the Word of God. Before we get into Zechariah this night, I want to open in prayer. I want to believe God for great things for you. But the Lamb of God, we honor you and we thank you. And God, we don't do so perfunctorily, but Father, we do so out of a heart that truly loves you. You've been good to us. You brought us back from uh, so many trials and you brought us through so many valleys, and God, we just thank you. We bind every spirit of hindrance in the name of Jesus. And Father, I pray that we we'll realize that as you told, uh, Zechariah told King Zerubbabel many, many years ago, it's not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, said the Lord of hosts. Bless us and encourage us, Lord. Keep our minds on you and let everything that's said or done give glory and honor and praise in the name of the Lord. In Jesus' holy and precious name we ask it. Amen and amen. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Praise God. We're going to try to continue our study with the third chapter of Zechariah this night. This was written in 519 B.C. B.C. Joshua the high priest. And as always, I'm going to read an expository notes. Hopefully it helps you to understand the verse a little bit clearer. It said, He showed me Joshua the high priest standing before the angel of the Lord and Satan standing at his right hand to resist him. The expository note says, At about this time, the Lord has spoken through the prophet Haggai. Prophet. Let me ask you, are there still prophets today? You say yes. Anybody else? Are there still prophets today? Yeah. Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 11. Talks about the fivefold ministry. Apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. So the fivefold ministry is still in existence today. Yeah, that's the book of Joel says that. And your, your old men shall dream dreams, and young men shall have visions, and I will pour my spirit upon all, all flesh. Praise the Lord. But in the old time, they were known as, uh, as seers. Seers. Uh, they, they could actually see into a life of an individual as the Spirit of God would, would reveal to them. And their messages um, were, the, the messages that were given to the true prophets of God came to pass. Not seven out of ten times, but every time... Uh, the Lord gave them a message. That message came to pass. And the Lord is still giving messages today. Uh, I pray that we as a church will hear what the Spirit is saying. From this day, the Lord has spoken to the prophet Haggai. From this day will I bless you. Haggai chapter 2 verse 19. Consequently, this blessing, which will be both material and spiritual, now commences with the material part promised to Haggai and the spiritual part given to Zechariah. Praise the Lord. Because Zechariah and Haggai... Uh, they, they, their ministry was at the same at the same time. One was in one one part of Israel, other was in the other northern and the southern kingdom. Praise the Lord! And they were speaking the word of God. The first phrase speaks of the high priest Joshua after the captivity, succeeding his father Josedek, who died in Babylon. Joshua, as the high priest, was representative of the entirety of the priesthood and also of Israel. Who is our great high priest today? Jesus Christ. He's our great high priest, praise the Lord. He's entered into the heavenlies. The angel of the Lord, at least in this instance, is Jehovah, as proved in the next verse. Zechariah has seen all of this in a vision, which gives us a glimpse into the spirit world. And as I said, a vision occurs when? When you're awake, and a dream, of course, when you are asleep. Praise the Lord. And remember, not everything you see is from the Lord. Not every vision you say you see is from the Lord. And not every dream that you have is from the Lord. But the Lord does speak to us in visions and in dreams. He's spoken to myself, and not to say I'm single out or unique, but he has spoken to me in dreams even before I accepted him as Lord and Savior. He was dealing with me in, in dreams. Uh, I didn't understand it. And he has given me uh, numerous times the interpretations of dreams. And I didn't even realize that, that this was a, a gift from the Lord because it is something that has been with me all of my life.
my life. It's like if you have brown hair or blonde hair or black hair all your life. I mean, well, that's you've had it. And so people would be, be telling their dreams, and all of a sudden, I knew exactly what he was talking about. But this had happened all my life. And so I, I'm not saying I didn't, I, didn't, I didn't realize it from the Lord. It's just that it had been a part of my life for so long that it was just as natural as breathing to, to myself there. Last part of the, the spouse note says, The phrase, And Satan standing his right hand to resist him, is the same personality described in Job chapter 1, 6 to 12, and 2 and 1. And Satan is a real being. As well, Joshua the high priest didn't see the vision on the Zechariah. Satan resisting Joshua the high priest, in effect, is resisting all of Israel with an effort to stop these prophecies from being fulfilled. What is the, what is, what is the, the, the threefold task of Satan? What is his threefold task? He comes to steal, to kill, and to destroy. He comes to steal what? What is he trying to steal from you? Huh? No, no. Well, that is included in there, but there's something. What are you trying to steal from you? He's trying to steal your faith. Your faith? Your faith, your faith, your faith. Because the Lord said without faith, it is impossible to please the Lord. Without faith. Faith is very important. And Satan, needs, he wants either to steal your faith or misdirect your faith so that your faith will be in something other than Jesus Christ and him crucified. He comes to kill what? He's coming to kill you, of course. But he's also coming to kill... The vision that the Lord has sown inside of you, your purpose, your reason for existing and breathing and your fulfillment in life is to do the will of God. He's coming to kill that so that it will make you ineffective, it will destroy you, and not only will destroy you, but it will hinder you from reaching other souls because that's what it's all about, folks. It's about telling other folks about the Lord and to destroy. To destroy what? And the church is who? Whom? Yeah, us. Us. Yeah. He's coming to destroy us. Destroy us. To destroy or to corrupt or to pervert. Because there's much that's being so-called uh, preached in this world that's being gospel that is not. It has nothing to do with the Lord. It sounds good and it works in particular localities, but if it's gospel, it's going to work all over the world. The gospel is not a system of, of, um, of uh, uh, do's and don'ts, and, and, and uh, it's not like an algebraic formula. You know, it's not. The gospel is simply Jesus Christ and him crucified. That's the gospel. And the Lord works with us where we are, not necessarily where we need to be, because if the Lord had to wait until we get where we need to be, then none of us would ever receive anything from the Lord. So God works with us where we are. And so Satan is coming to destroy, to corrupt, or to pervert you and the message of the gospel the Lord has given you. And that's why it's so important that you know the word of God and not only know it, but that you believe the word of God. You know, a number of Christians that actually spend time in prayer, and I, it's been a long time since I studied this, the number of Christians, and they estimate that they're about s between 75 and 80 million Christians in the U.S., just an estimate. And the population in the U.S. is 300 million people. So 75 to 80 million Christians are in the U.S. But according to the polls, the U.S. is 90 plus percent Christian. Yeah, I believe polls. But the number of Christians that actually read the Word of God is a, a very, very low percentage. And this was based on polls that was submitted by an organization called the Barna Research Group, a Christian, supposed to be Christian-based organization that sends out polls, posters, and sends out uh, uh, polls in the mail and asks for responses from, from churches, from individuals. And they've been around. They're a very, very good organization. I have, I have looked at them. They're very good. And they said the number of Christians that actually pray out of this number is, want to take a guess? Yeah, but how, any ideas in the, in the what? Just grab a number percent-wise. A little bit higher than that, praise the Lord. They said about 